So welcome to today's podcast where I'm joined by the infamous or the, the famous Doc Sheldon. Doc, thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. I think you're probably closer with the infamous, uh, Craig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. No, it's a, a privilege to have a man um, of your experience and a man I've watched a lot over the years and learned from, um, not just yourself, obviously, your fellow colleagues, Bill and Amon and, and various other people out there. So uh, for me, it's it's a, it's always good to have guys like you on um, after learning and, and you know, watching a lot of stuff over the years. It's, it's a... Yeah, I don't think I've, I've. I don't think I'll ever probably have someone that I've watched that much. You know, from your kind of, you know, your kind. Of, unless I can get Bill on or whatever, um, you know, I, th- I don't think I'll have the same feeling um, towards anyone else. <laughs> it was weird having watched a lot of stuff on you guys to then finally, you know, talk to you in a podcast. Yeah, you need to be more um, selective in who but, you watch, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, you taught me a lot of bad stuff. That's how I've got a bad reputation. <laughs> it's listening to you too much. <laughs> but, um, no, as I say, um, but for anyone who doesn't know who you are, Doc, can you tell the audience um, a bit about yourself and what you've done over the, the kind of last 20 years? Oh, well, you know, I, I worked for about 20 years as a business consultant uh, in the offline world and decided to retire early. And uh, about the same time I decided to retire, Wall Street went tits up and left me without any financial reserves. So I decided to go back to work, but I didn't want to be on the road for six months of the year anymore. So I decided to start working online. And because I had some background in in marketing and uh, publishing, I decided that SEO copywriting might be a a good way to go. I started with that. And I got so interested in SEO that uh, I started studying SEO. And pretty soon that was the, the tail wagging the dog. And I, I started paying more attention to the uh, SEO portion. The last uh, 17 years, this is what I've been doing. And I I still have the content agency, but my partner basically runs that. And I've been focusing on uh, SEO. And I've tightened my focus over the last few years to the technical aspects rather than working on organic optimization or the paid, which I detest. Uh, I focus on the technical, you know, getting the site to be fast, to be efficient, to be, you know, crawlable, indexable. And over the last uh, year and a half, I've started focusing heavily on GDPR because there, I, I find such a dearth of, of awareness. Nobody seems to even, I shouldn't say nobody, many companies don't even seem to know it exists. And of those who have heard of it, most of them think it doesn't apply to them. And the, the vast majority <laughs> of them are wrong. Hey. So I focus now uh, heavily on the technical aspects of GDPR, yeah. doing <laughs> compliance audits and helping companies get into compliance with the uh, this GDPR, the General Data Protection regulation out of the EU. And that's what I've been working on most, almost exclusively for the last year now. So. A year um, of GDPR. You, you obviously mention that, um, you know, the vast majority of people are ignorant or are or, or totally unaware of what GDPR is and, and obviously feel that it's not relevant to them um, and we we had a brief chat prior to coming on here like when gdpr was rolled out there was no government initiative or i, I you know i'm not blaming the government uh, you know i don't know whose responsibility it would be to make a bigger awareness it kind of almost dropped on our lap saying you know you just heard people talking about gdpr you you have to be gdpr compliant and and stuff like that so i think that obviously you know, is a big factor in it. There was no real build up to it. The you know, we all know that Brexit's happening and, and stuff like that, and it's been talked spoken about for years, and it's all over the press. But with GDPR and and you know, it was basically landed on your lap. Um, that that is obviously never going to be helpful. But I'm assuming you're then you've got problems 
and educating people as to why they should be taking GDPR seriously. Yeah, uh, often, you know, I don't do a lot of outreach for this. Uh, I get most of my, my work via referrals. And a lot of the times the, the uh, mm-hmm. client company is already of an opinion that GDPR doesn't apply to them. I do, I'm doing a, a client right now whose business is almost entirely U.S.-based customers. And so what they did is they simply blocked all European IP addresses, which is, is a shame because an awful lot of international, they, they're a, a, a B2B, and most uh, international companies will have a presence in the EU and in the U.S., so they're, they've lost that visibility. It, it seems a shame. So trying to convince them that, uh, yes, it can apply to you, and here's how, and, and here are the possible repercussions if you don't comply, is sometimes a, a, an uphill battle. And people resist it, you know, that, especially in the U.S. You know, we Americans are, are a bit bullish about not being told what to do by anybody, much less somebody outside of our own borders. And uh, being told that the European Union can arbitrarily tell us what we can do with our business in the U.S., that rankles, you know, that, that really pisses some people off. And uh, my, my attitude on GDPR is it's basically common decency and common sense. You know, the main premise of GDPR is that someone's personal data belongs to them in perpetuity. The fact that you've gathered their name and, and social security number, for instance, does not suddenly make that your data. It is always theirs. Now, that's just common sense and, and common decency. And then protecting that data and giving them some some uh, avenues, you know, some recourse to to change it or have it deleted or not have it processed in a way that they don't want, that's, that's just common sense, too. So that's what GDPR is meant to do. So if you look at it from that standpoint, it, it shouldn't bother you quite as much. Uh, the other thing that I, that I run into is, is when I show the GDPR to somebody who is unfamiliar with it, their reaction is much like my first reaction was. Good Lord, look at this. This is going to cost me millions. You know, if they're a large corporation, they're talking about taking on uh, perhaps, you know, at least one, perhaps several more uh, full-time employees which is a cost. They're talking about a lot of disruption of their internal operations to implement the new policies and procedures and train staff and all this. So for a large international corporation, it can be a major hit to their bottom line. Uh, but the vast majority of, of companies yeah. aren't faced with that. For, for a blogger, for instance, even if you're just blogging and providing free information, uh, free information to your readers, you're still uh, potentially liable to comply. So, because the, the regulation specifically says it doesn't matter if any money changes hands. If you're gathering data, you're gathering data. If you're processing it, if you're passing it outside of the EU, these are all things that make you susceptible to certain aspects of the regulation. So, it's not it's not that much of a stretch to just think, okay, uh, I've gathered someone's information. I, they have a right to expect me to treat it in a certain way because every single year, every month, we have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users who have their data exposed because of breaches or hacks or, or just poor security. And that often falls into the hands of, of folks that like to sell lists, that like to use phony uh, accounts, that like to make fraudulent charges against banks or credit cards. So the risk is tremendous. There are literally hundreds of billions of dollars lost every single year because of breaches. Hundreds of billions of of dollars out of users' pockets, uh, and much of it is unrecoverable. The other thing that happens, an awful lot of of users have credit cards, for instance, that protect them against that sort of thing. So the bank loses the money instead, which means that for all of us, the cost of using those banks will go up. You know, the, the, the impact is widespread. So we need to protect their data. And GDPR is simply motivating. They have massive potential fines under GDPR, You're up to 20 million euros or 4% of your annual turnover, whichever is greater. But 
it's not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be motivational. They they scale those fines depending upon the seriousness of the infraction. Mm-hmm. So they're not trying to put people out of business. Uh, it, it is intended to be able to be an incentive to comply. And it should be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that makes sense, obviously. Yeah, you've got to hit people in the pocket sometimes to, to teach them a lesson. Um, and th- that that obviously would um, scare people. You know, the thought of someone taking that, you know, 4% or 20 million from your, your company, um, you know, it's, it's, that that's going to give people a wake-up call. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that there's guys out there who think that the, you know, they, they don't comply um, with GDPR and stuff like that and and probably won't ever comply with it and there's obviously this and I'm not sure how widespread this uh, misconception may be but you know the, the rumour in, in the UK or the circles that I speak to feel that you know GDPR will only apply to big companies like Amazon and, and you know bigger companies is, is it actually the case that smaller companies are also being put through the, the kind of legal process there and are some fined? Uh, considerably smaller companies that have been fined. Usually what happens is, you know, in the cases that I have seen at least, what happens is something comes to their attention. Uh, they decide to do an audit of the company to see you know, what caused this breach. Did the company comply with the requirements for notification and whatnot? And depending upon what they find, they may assess a fine, okay? Okay. Uh, what I have seen in in almost every single case is an, a, an assessment of the good faith effort to comply. And if they felt like the company was making a good faith effort, but fell somewhat shy in a particular regard, they're usually much more lenient. Uh, if they find blatant disregard and, you know, basically a the hell with it, I'm not going to do this attitude, uh, I think you can expect the maximum, Okay. Uh, there have been some small companies. I saw a company not too long ago who probably had a, I didn't see the exact numbers, but I, I would guesstimate looking at the business, they were probably well under a million dollars annual turnover. They got fined 1,500 euros, okay? Because they had gone through uh, some some major effort. They had really made an honest effort to comply but they had a breach because of a, of a security flaw that was found and exploited on their servers. And they, and they did notify. So they made every honest effort to comply, but they fell slightly shy. And it was basically a slap on the wrist. I mean, 1,500 euros is not that big a deal. But it, it was a wake-up call to them. But they again, they had really tried. Yeah. And, and, mm. and, and not over the last three weeks. They had been working on it since... Uh, 2017. So that to me was a very almost lenient, at the very least, a very fair uh, fine. I think they probably, the commission probably felt uh, it was incumbent on them to do something to slap them on the wrist, and it was a token amount. So uh, you've probably heard about, uh, you know, Facebook and and Google, of course, are huge targets, both of whom have taken uh, a very antagonistic attitude towards. European regulations. So I think they made an example of them. You know, they had not made a, what was deemed to be a very uh, honest effort to comply. They basically thumbed their nose at the commission and, <laughs> you know, it was one of those screw you. No, screw you. <laughs> so. So. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Facebooks and stuff, companies of that size think they are above the world and it's good to sometimes rein that in because, um, as you say, people's data is theirs and and it's not because someone signed up for a newsletter doesn't mean you've got the right to, you know, (coughs) abuse and abuse people's data and sell it on and and whatever else um, goes on in this world. And I think... Um, it's obviously too early to say, you know, because people are not doing GDPR, whether, you know, I think it will take 
10 years or so, or, or you know, five or 10 years to be able to see the impact of GDPR and obviously slowing down the amount of spam we all get and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's, it's way too early to see whether that's going to be the right or the, you know, or, or whether they need to ch- adapt their approach. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, c- companies looking to implement this stuff, um, you know, where do, where do you start? Where's a good place to learn more about GDPR other than hiring a guy like you who's taking the time to research it all? You know, where do well, people look to, to find first, out what you need to do? My first suggestion would be to be very, very careful. You know, there's an awful lot of, of, of information available on the internet. You know, people that are setting themselves up as experts or consultants and whatnot. Uh, and I see an awful lot of, much like as, as is the case in SEO, who are putting out incorrect information and of course there are some again like seo there are some that are simply trying to take advantage of an opportunity to dip into someone else's pocket so you need to be very very careful there are a couple of uh, facebook groups if, you know for anybody who has a presence on facebook if you if you do a search on facebook for gdpr there's a couple of very large groups there uh, i came across some some very knowledgeable people quickly, you know, when, you, when you're involved in conversations like this, you see the people who are very opinionated and very, very uh, bullish on their attitudes. And then the other people who are much more open-minded and say, well, you know, we're not really sure, but we suspect this and this could be that. I find that a more reasonable approach because there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of, of, of the regulation that can be open to interpretation. So if you find those groups, you know, and you spend a little time in there look, reading these threads, I think you'll quickly spot a few people. I found an attorney over there, and I'll even name her. Her name is Ann P. Mitchell. Very knowledgeable, very professional, and I have referred her many times to, to people that needed a, a legal opinion. Uh, typically, a, a large corporation, you know, an Amazon or, or, or Facebook, would need a legal staff to, to help them interpret and implement. Uh, a, a blogger or a small business would not necessarily need to have a, a lawyer look at it, but there are questions. You know, if, if something is a little iffy, I always I, I have a disclaimer on my on my site and on my quotations that I am not an attorney. You know, these are my my good faith attitude, you know, uh, uh, interpretations. But if you need a specific legal finding, you should go to an attorney. I can recommend one if you like, and. It's uh, it's very touchy. Again, you know, you've got to be careful because mm-hmm. there is a lot of misinformation out there. So that is one good resource. Uh, another good resource that has not yet been made public, supposedly in the uh, the ICO, which is the uh, the UK version, you know, the Commission is is going to be publishing a list of certified. Uh, GDPR consultants. Uh, I have not been able to see yet the criteria for certification, but it is it is a certification of compliance by the commission. So I would hope that it would be a fairly reliable thing that these these are people who who are working within the the, the realm of the regulation and, and giving good guidance. So. Uh, I will be sharing that as soon as it does happen. I've heard, you know, rumor is saying that it's, it's going to be happening before the end of the year. I hope that's true. Uh, that would be another resource when it happens. Uh, the other thing is just like with any sort of, of service, I think that referrals, recommendations from other clients. Uh, most companies that I have seen, they're not trying to do it in-house. To, to, to get out there and learn it and then take all the steps mm-hmm. uh, to comply is a, is a massive effort when you're starting from ground zero. So most companies are not doing that. Their, their implementation may be in-house, but they're, they're bringing in outside consultants. So if you find a company that is, especially if it's a, 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 you know, a, a, a business that is sized similarly to your own, who has obviously made the effort to comply, and it's not not just downloading some WordPress plugin that calls itself GDPR compliance or something. 
uh, if they've done more than that, you might reach out to them and ask them, hey, did you did you work with somebody outside of your organization? We're looking to do this, and you seem to have gotten your ducks in a row. Is there somebody you would recommend? That can be helpful, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, I think yeah, you have to look at other people and see what they're doing as well and, and take inspiration from that because they could have spent, you know, X amount of money getting those ducks in a row. So it's a, it's a good suggestion, that one. Um, is there any other places where people can learn? I mean, I mean it, because it's such a new subject, it, I think it's it's like being new to SEO again. You just don't know who the hell to believe, um, you know, because there are guys out there portraying themselves to be, you know, experts when, and then you look between the lines and you can, you know, spot them a mile away, like just chatting absolute garbage. And, and as you say, I, looking to dip into people's pockets, it's, uh, it's, it's insane. But we're always going yeah, to be faced I with that now. I don't know of, of the, any a good resource uh, at this is. point, Craig. Uh, you know, that's an interesting idea. I, I might try to, you know, get with some people and try to put together some sort of a list. Uh, I, I do GDPR compliance audits for my clients and help them uh, get in compliance. But it is, you know, I by no means consider myself an expert. I, I have you know, maybe a year and a half of involvement with it. I've done an awful lot of research, spent a lot of time working on it, but uh, still, like just like anything, there's a lot left to learn. And I think a lot of it is going to be, a lot of that learning is going to be on the process side from the commission standpoint. Yeah. You know, they, it really was a very valiant effort to put together an extensive regulation in a relatively short period of time they covered the bases pretty well, okay? But there are, because the regulation covers basically every conceivable scenario, there are a lot of areas that is is difficult for some businesses to determine, does this apply to me or not? There's some gray in interpretation. And I think a lot of that interpretation is going to come out as cases arise and we see how the commission responds to them. And, and we'll start seeing some clarification come. The one thing that I have seen that I have been rather dismayed with, normally with something this complex, you would hope that there would be a contact point where someone could send a specific question to someone in power, you know, someone at the commission and say, okay, if this is the way we're doing this, are we good? Are we, are we in compliance? And you can request an audit. But I mean, I suppose you could go to the tax the tax board and request an audit too. But does anybody really want to open that Pandora's box if they're not sure? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and plus the fact that you know you got to understand, there's an awful <laughs> lot of of non compliant <laughs> entities out there that the commission is trying to to look at and handle. They have all these different supervisor th- supervisory authorities scattered around the different member states of the union. And that's that was brilliant the way that they did that. They managed to to uh, diffuse that effort somewhat. But how many of those member states are going to have a massive staff to handle this? You know, there's, there's budget constraints laid upon them as well. So, trying to to make people available to do even voluntary audits mm-hmm. is going to be a bit of a stretch, depending upon where you're located. So. No, there is no place. I wish that there was something I could recommend. Like I say, I, I do these audits, and I do not mm. consider myself an expert. I don't know of any other non-lawyer uh, that is working in this area that I would consider to be uh, very proficient okay, and reliable. I, I do know some people that are looking at it, and I think you know, they're trying to decide, is this something yeah. that they want to really delve into? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, none of them have yet. Why I decided to, I have no idea. Just a glutton for punishment, I suppose. It's fascinating to me. It's it's an educational process. But like I said, I'm, I'm learning every day. So <laughs> I'm not an expert. And I can't say, here are experts. I do have that one attorney that uh, that I, I feel uh, qualifies. But... She's a practicing attorney, and this is this is an area of her practice. She is not going to be able to come in and do 
what a, a company needs in terms of, of auditing and, and determining their compliance needs. Uh, she and then plus the fact who wants to pay a lawyer's rate, you know, hourly rate to, to see if something complies or to see if they need to worry about it. It's, you know, it's just, it could be uh, financially prohibitive. So, you know, watch this space. I will try to find uh, better resources. That wasn't a question I even came prepared for. So uh, I don't know of any off the top of my head, but I will start, well, I will start looking because I, you know, that's a very valid concern. Uh, maybe I'll get together <laughs> some people and try to put together a list of, of some resources. Yeah. Yeah, be perfect if you could. Um, on on to something else that, that obviously I, I would like to ask you know because I'm not a GDPR expert by you know it's not I, I wouldn't even come close to even saying I know much about it. Um, but you know I know there's guys in the the UK um, who obviously I'm not politi- I'm not into politics in a big way either. But Brexit's coming up, and some people think. I to hell with Brexit's coming up, we won't have to bother our asses with this. We're leaving the EU and hedge their bets on that kind of um, way of, of thinking. Well, what, what supposedly would you the idea with the Commission in the UK, got that train of, uh, they have train said of that uh, their intent is to adopt a regulation that will basically be a carbon copy of GDPR okay, upon Brexit. So if a company in the UK is working towards GDPR compliance, they should not face any necessity to rework things. Uh, you know, the efforts that they're undertaking now should be perfectly valid uh, if the ICO decides to follow through on what they've stated. Uh, the The impact of Brexit is, I think, a lot of us don't really know yet how deep the impact is going to be. I, you know, obviously, the trade aspect is going to be a heavy one. But in terms of, of processing, the big thing that I see uh, coming about is if you are in the UK after Brexit, you will now be outside the EU. So uh, if you're gathering information of EU residents and transferring that to your own company in, say, Birmingham, you are now moving personal data outside of the union Therefore, you become not only a controller, but a processor. And, you know, that's going to be the major impact. And it, it won't be a major impact. I mean, it, that's going to be the big change, but it won't really impact companies that much because if they're complying as a controller and they're doing their own processing at their own, uh, their own facilities in the U.K., their compliance efforts will be just as valid as a processor. They simply have to dot a few more I's, cross a few more T's to, to you know, fill in all the blanks. They will have a dual role. They'll be both controller and processor. If they're using a UK-based processor external of their own organization, the same will be true. They'll simply be required to ensure that that processor uh, is complying with the aspects that are that are required because data is being moved outside of the EU, which you know is basically you have to have an agreement uh, with certain clauses present between yourself and your processors, mm-hmm. and, and those same clauses would apply if it was an in-house processing operation. But uh, it's more of a contractual thing, you know, it, it, a formal agreement. Mm-hmm. If it's an outside processor, even if they're right across the street from you in Birmingham, so the impact will not be tremendous, but that will be a change that that you know in their status, they will now now also be a processor. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, I wouldn't expect much impact. So, uh, you know. So just to clarify for anyone who doesn't understand the difference between um, someone, um, you know, the, the processor and the contact, but, you know, what would you say in short is the, the difference? Is it, you know, for someone in, who's, you know, in the UK, 
who's now going to also be a processor, is that going to mean uh, that you're going to have to... If you, by suddenly taking TV on the additional role of processor, no. It will not be more compliant. Basically, a controller is someone who gathers and receives uh, personal data, okay? And the processor, whether it be the controller or an outside entity, the processor is someone who uses that data, processes it to... You know, whether it be for marketing purposes, communications purposes, uh, com- to comply with a, a uh, sales contract, whatever, in any way whatsoever that you that they process that information in a means that is uh, potentially identifiable to the data subject, which is you know the user who's the owner of that information. They're the processor, so there's not uh, not a difference in the responsibilities. It's just basically a matter of definitions. You know, like I say, the, the biggest thing is that there needs to be a formal agreement, a contractual arrangement between a controller and a processor if they're outside the organization. You can't simply have a, a, a word of mouth agreement. You can't continue with business as usual with your brother-in-law down the street. You have to have something formal in writing. Uh, and you have to, there are requirements uh, to when you have to report such exportation from your company to a processor, uh, exportation from the EU to an entity outside the EU, uh, to supervisory authorities. You know, the the big thing that I think that also is going to fall, that I just thought of that's going to fall upon UK-based businesses after Brexit is there is a requirement for any business that is not physically located within the EU or the EEA, the European Economic Area, the you must have a representative, okay, somewhere in the in the member state where you're doing business. Now, if you're in the EU, pick a member state. You can have one in, in Belgium or Germany or, or France or Spain, you know, wherever. As long as it's a member state of the EU, you can have a representative. And this is basically someone who can be. Uh, a, a local, if you will, contact point, you know, within the EU local, that can be someone who can receive service of, of uh, legal documents, that can be held responsible. It, it, it's a legal representative, much like in the United States, many people have, they may live in Texas, but they have a Delaware corporation. They have to have a legal representative in Delaware to do that. And that person can receive notifications and services from the Delaware government, okay, on their behalf. It's the same, the same concept. Uh, so if you're, if you're in the UK and after Brexit, now you will be required to find a representative. Now, this presents a problem for everybody because at present, there is a real uh, dearth of representatives available, okay? This is something that just was not foreseen, and, and there aren't nearly enough people out there that are prepared to become legal representatives within different member states as compared to the number of companies who are looking for them. You and I both know when, when that sort of a situation arises, Craig, you're going to have all sorts of jack legs jumping up and saying, send me, you know, send me a million euros. I'll be your representative. <laughs> and the person is not going to fulfill the requirements. All they're going to do is cash your check. So, that is 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 where I think that having a a list of certified representatives is going to be imperative, and that list needs to grow rapidly because there just aren't enough people available. I mean, one person can be representative for a number of companies, obviously, but there's it's a real uphill battle. I am looking for one right now for a client and having a hard time finding somebody who is available and affordable and capable. The capable is important because if that per- if that person fails to comply, they can make my company liable for massive fines. You know, I'm responsible for ensuring that they comply. So they're basically they're representing my brand and they can hurt us if they don't do their job. So you have to be very careful with that. That will affect UK citizens after Brexit. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, so, 
you know, in terms of implementing or, or, or someone coming to you to um, get you to do one of your GDPR um, audits, if you like, and, and, you know, start to the ball rolling with that process. And I know it's going to, you know, it's going to be one of those answers where you're going to say it, it depends and, and, you know, the, the size of the company and all the processes and how much data they collect. But just in general, like, can a company get someone like you in and get this done in a month or, or, or does it take far longer? I, obviously, it will take far longer on the Well, the average size, project, let's say a company that has... How long does it take uh, to become GDPR but they're compliant selling to for an English-speaking countries in the EU, but they're based in the US, okay? And they've done nothing yet to comply. You know, they just became aware of GDPR. An average size company that's, that's uh, let's say, 50 employees at a max, you know, they mm-hmm. probably are not going to be faced with a lot of requirements. Basically, they're going to have to uh, establish some written procedures and policies. They're going to have to mm-hmm. change the way that they handle data in terms of, you know, their IT people are going to have to ensure that uh, synonymization is in, is and encryption are utilized in moving any of that data, even within the company. They're going to have to establish policies to limit the access to that data to the people that actually need it for processing purposes. They're going to have to change their website somewhat to make sure that when people are asked to supply, let's say they're signing up for a newsletter, they give me your username and an email and we'll send you our weekly newsletter. Okay, well, if you're taking their email, you're gathering personal data. And that personal data can can conceivably be connected to that individual even though they give you a fictitious username. So you have to make them aware of why you want mm-hmm. it and what you're going to do with it and who you're going to share it with, if anybody, and of their rights under GDPR in terms of having it corrected if it's mistaken, yeah. uh, the uses of it limited, to get a copy of it, uh, you know, all, to have it removed and deleted entirely, or that right to be forgotten thing. So you, these are changes that will have to be made. It will depend tremendously on the client's ability to to uh, generate these things. Now, one of the, the services that we offer, we offer in three phases. We first come in and, and do an audit. We, we assess the business and its operations and say, okay, here are the things you need to do to become compliant. The second phase is actually providing with roadmap and templates of, for these documents. of here's, here's the specific tasks you need to complete. And that, you know, it might take me a one or two weeks to do the first phase. Uh, It's going to depend very much upon the the business's motivation and staffing uh, resources as to how fast they can do that second phase. And then the third phase, we come back and again do an audit, a compliance audit, make sure that everything was uh, properly implemented, is fully functional, and still, you know, does actually comply in all regards, and give them a written report of that. Uh, that serves as documentation should they ever fall under the scrutiny of the commission. It serves as documentation of, of their efforts, which always helps, okay? Shows good faith effort. And and uh, if it does need correction, obviously, then those corrections would need to be made as well. So it can take, I have seen it take as little as, as uh, two weeks for a very small company. You know, this company, I think, had eight, eight people, no, seven people. And they dealt with people in the UK. So, at, you know, presently, because the UK is still in the EU, they had to comply in that regard. They decided that they might as well go whole hog and make sure they're still compliant after Brexit. Uh, I am working on one right now that I expect is going to take upwards of three or four months because I know that the, the in-house uh, staff limitations is going to make it very difficult to, for them to push through all these changes, uh, documentation. A company that, that has 500 employees, you know, there's training that's involved of all these people too. You know, so there's going to be some training sessions required. So, the, you know, you can imagine that could add many weeks to a process as well as, as some cost. So, you know, I haven't had to, mm-hmm. uh, to deal with a client that really – had a, you know, that many employees and was, was going to have to f- go to get 200 people trained without impacting their operation. You're going to have to stagger those courses over a couple of months. Uh, that becomes prohibitive in terms of time and cost. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. But basically, you know, 
one or two weeks to find out if and how much you need to comply. And then whatever you can do in terms of complying, and which is going to be contingent upon how many people you have available and how many things need to be done. And then uh, the final audit, you know, again, that's, that's generally a, a, uh, a week or two to, to prepare, to, to actually perform it and prepare a written report. So anywhere from a month to six months, <laughs> depends. You know, depends is always uh, is always a uh, always an issue. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I knew it was going to be a dep- it depends answer, but um, I, I think it's obviously good for people to hear the kind of what goes on behind it, and and you know, as I say, it's, it depends because you might have to train 200 staff is still a good answer. It just gives people something to think about in terms of, you know, the the task that lies ahead. Um, But, you know, going forward, you know, I think we we spoke about it previously prior to uh, coming on to the podcast is that people instantly look at what's involved in GDPR and instantly shit their pants going, oh, shit. And I think... In general, yeah, I think you know that was my first it, impression it when, I, when I first looked at the, the regulation. It, you know, it basically is intended to cover is, is, every would, conceivable you know, would that scenario. Would be right with that kind of thought? So when somebody looks at it, you know, it's 150 pages of, of uh, semi legalese, and and their impression is, oh my god, this is going to cost me an arm and a leg. This is going to take me forever to do. You know, why do I need to have this? Uh, many of the requirements in the regulation are are not going to apply to most businesses. They're going to, they're going to apply to people like uh, Facebook and Google and Amazon. Certainly they're going to apply to apply to a lot of, of smaller corporations as well. You know, but there are things that are not required. For instance, one is, is an example is the DPO, the data protection officer. Uh, some companies will be required depending upon their size, the number of employees they have and the type of information that they handle. If they handle, let's say medical, you know, biometric type data, they, they're going to be required to have a DPO. That's going to be a dedicated full-time independent individual on the payroll who this is all they do. They, they ensure ongoing compliance. And, uh, but most companies will not face that requirement. They simply, they can assign the DPO's duties to someone in-house as a collateral duty. However, it must, you know, the the, the only issue there is they've got to be sure that any other duties this yeah. individual has do not present a conflict of interest. In other words, if, if this person is, is faced with the necessity to, to uh, enforce a certain style of, of processing internally the information, are they also in charge of the IT crew who, who is responsible for updating the website? Because now that you've got, they're trying to divide the attention of their staff between task A and task B. And if there's a conflict of interest, the, the DPO's duties must always take precedence. So you, you have to avoid a conflict of interest. So that's just, you know, but most companies won't need a dedicated DPO. They could just have someone assign the responsibilities. Now, as long as that person's, responsibilities don't conflict Mm -hmm. and they're and they're given the resources with which to do their job then uh you're good you know it's it's so it seems very prohibitive when you look at the regulation as, as it's you know in its entirety but it really doesn't apply in its entirety to most companies yeah Oh, yeah, yeah. Pretty much sums up my impression, too. Yeah, shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that's obviously the first thing I saw when I seen GDPR was shit. Um, and how am I going to deal with this? And <laughs> <laughs> um, But it's good to know that, obviously, um, you know, once you unravel all the all the stuff that goes on and, and what's involved, that, you know, Parts of it definitely don't apply to you, um, but I think you know if you to to give people 
you know, an end kind of thing. You know, I think it's common sense and common decency is just being put into practice and it's it's trying to eliminate the, the, the people who spam the crap out of stuff and, and don't build marketing lists organically. You know, people who are buying lists and stuff are all, all the ones that are going to suffer. And I don't think that's always a bad thing. Well, yeah. Um, in most cases, so yeah, you sum it I think up, you, you know, there has to be some kind of law because it is literally a free for all. The main online. premise of the Just regulation is, is that someone's there personal was no data is re- there new forever. Regulation. The fact that you now have it in your possession does not make it yours. It is theirs. And they have the right to know, they have the right to control, and they have the right to have it deleted, they have the right to get a, a copy of it. You know, They have a number of rights that are outlined under the regulation, and you know, it is it is incumbent upon us to make them aware of those rights when they hit our website, or or at a, and if it's a trade show, it can also be in a face to face meeting at a trade show, for instance, or in a sales call. You know, the regulation applies when there is interaction between their personal data and an entity. So, you know, the there are limitations. You know, the fact that you have my email address because we met at a bar does not mean that you have to read me like a Miranda card, you know, read me my rights when you ask me for my email address. Uh, but if you take that email address and, and do anything with it, put it into your system, okay, you take it, you know, put it into your electronic Rolodex, yay. If you did that on an occasional basis, not a, not a big thing. It doesn't necessarily apply. But if you're going to a trade show and you get 1,500 cards and put them all in, now you're approaching a scale that does require some sort of, of compliance, okay? And uh, those are the, the gray areas. And I think they were left intentionally uh, vague. They don't say that if you have, uh, you know, 149 of these or less, that you're okay. But if you have 150 or more, you're not. Uh, they simply say, you know, if you're doing it on a large scale or a small scale, uh, if you're doing it occasionally or regularly, okay. what is occasionally? You know, well, occasionally is I occasionally meet somebody in a bar and I get their business card. I can defend that decision, and I'm sure that the commission would agree. But uh, if I'm if I'm giving away a free Mercedes Benz, if you you know, uh, with a drawing, if you'll put your business card in there, and I gather five thousand business cards and put them all into my system, <laughs> that approaches a scale that is probably going to be very difficult to defend. <laughs> I'm going to have to, to treat that as personal data. So it's, it's common sense, you know, it's just remembering that the, that the, the information is not ours simply because we came into possession of it and remembering that the, yeah. the users that, you know, the res- the, the people that are the owners of that data <laughs> remain the owner. Yes. And it's must have control to- of it. Sure. Yeah, and, and as I say, common decency comes into play as well. You just wouldn't do that with a normal person's data, surely. Um, you know, I have probably done it in the past, but, um, you know, realistically, none of us want to, to have that going on. But... Um, Sadly, Doc, we are at the 50-minute part, and I know we could probably talk all day about lots of different subjects, um, especially given a man of your experience. Um, but I'd love to have, have you on in the future um, to cover Well, I, I can stuff. always be found talk about different on Facebook, yeah. um, Doc Sheldon. But for anyone who is interested and, uh, in my um, email getting a hold of you or potentially talking to you about GDPR or something SEO. else, where, where's the best place to get a hold of you? Uh, or Doc Sheldon at gmail.com. Okay. And if, if you can't find me, you can always find Craig. Uh, somewhere back in our lineage, we are related. We're both Campbells. So you know, he, he generally knows where to find me too. <laughs> yeah if you if anyone's listening and you struggle to find doc give me a shout and i can point you to the nearest uh place to find them wherever he may be in the world at that point in time um 
But yeah, thank you, Doc, very much for taking time out of your life to talk to me and, and a oh, bit I've about GDPR. I would also uh, I think a lot of people there, hopefully you know, have a I'm not bit of a better understanding you, as a result. You know, I'm not going to give you my PayPal address and, if you have a question. Um, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, thank you very much. I don't for always have all out. the answers. But I can either point you to some place you can get the answer, or I can pop, perhaps get one for you if I don't know it off the top of my head. But uh, feel free to to reach out to me if if you have a specific question. Perfect, Doc. Thank you. Doc, thank you. Doc, thank you. Doc, thank you. Doc, thank you.